I'd like to welcome you to our program, Truth For Today. I'm Pastor Steve Carr of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande. Today we live in confusing times. However, God's Word can be a tremendous source of strength and guidance to those who believe. I'd like to invite you to join with us as we study through God's inspired Word. God has many truths He would like to communicate to you, but His greatest desire is that you might know Him and the love He has for you. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These words reveal how long he has loved you and how much he cares. If you will open your heart to him, I am confident that he will reveal himself to you and greatly encourage you today. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to begin with verse 1 here, looking at the story and the record of the birth of Christ. In our study here of uh, the Gospel of Luke, we come to this very important section of Scripture. And I want to ask you this morning, do you ever wonder when Christ was actually born? I mean, is it December 25th? Or is it some other time? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Well, here in our study this morning, uh, Luke is a tremendous historian, and he reveals that by his giving us this record and some very important time notes that are revealed in this text. So read with me verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, and this, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes or swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger or literally a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, what brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem? This, I believe, is an important question, and I want to answer it two ways this morning. The first is very obvious. From our text here, a decree goes out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was a registration, a census, that would be then used for taxation. Now, Caesar Augustus reigned from 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. And so we have a general time frame there, a reference to when this took place. But that's pretty general. It's very difficult for us to narrow down this particular uh, point at which he was born. Now, this decree was given every five years under the Roman rule 
Now, this is recorded for us by Tacitus, the Roman historian. Every five years, all in the Roman Empire, beginning in 5 BC, were to be registered in their hometown, wherever they owned property, which means that Joseph still must have owned property there in the city of Bethlehem. And so this, this registration went on every five years. So this gives us a little closer, a little bit more insight into when this actually occurred. Now notice in verse 2, it says this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Now this narrows the time frame even further because in some of your Bibles you will see it says when Quirinius was governor of Syria. The New King James translates this more clearly, more specifically, governing. Because this particular man was again by according to the Roman historian Tacitus, he was the governor of the nation of Crete and of Egypt in 15 BC. He then was moved by Caesar Augustus because he was a military man. He headed the rebellion or the uh, attempt by Caesar, the Romans, to put down a, a rebellion that was occurring and that began in 12 BC in the area of Asia Minor and Syria. And so from 12 BC, he was governing over that area, even though he was not specifically the governor of Syria. He was governing that area. This particular word here that is used in our text is not the normal word for a governor which is a totally different word than what is here in our text. This particular word literally means to be in charge or to lead, to be leading. And so as the military leader, the one governing over this entire area, he fulfills this particular text. Now, this man then became the governor twice in history of the area of Syria first in 4 BC to 1 AD, and then another governor took over, and, but he was deposed, and then he came back in 6 AD. And this, this gives us a little clearer indication of the time frame. And so from this, these historical records, we can see very clearly that this particular registration had to have taken place somewhere between 5 and 6 BC. And so this is when the birth of Christ occurred. So somewhere in that period of time. Now, we also, the reason why I say this is because we have one more time note. And that time note is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. Now there, what we see recorded for us is this issue of Herod the Great. He was reigning during the time that Jesus was born. <coughs> Herod the Great reigned from 37 B.C. To, to 4 B.C. So from 37 to 4 B.C. Now the reason why I say that probably Jesus was born anywhere from 5 to 6 B.C., is because you remember the story. The wise men came, they told Herod, they told him they were looking for a king that had been born, the king of the Jews. The scribes came and told these wise men that this child would be born in Bethlehem from according to scripture. So they headed to Bethlehem and he asked them to come back and tell him if they found this king. Now, these wise men were warned by God in a dream to not do that. And so they proceeded back to their home. Well, a period of time, we don't know how long, took place between their finding the Christ child and then Herod declaring out of his own fear that this child would depose him. 
He sent his soldiers and he had all of the, the babies from two years and under killed. Now why did he do that? Because there was this space of time. And then Herod dies in 4 BC. So somewhere between 5 and 6 BC, this Christ child is born. And so this is the well, the seemingly most obvious reason why Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. But there's a second very important reason why. Not only was the decree of Caesar Augustus what led these two back to their home land or their, their, this city of Bethlehem, but it was also the decree of God. You see, 700 years earlier, the very verse of scripture that the wise men received from the scribes was Micah 5.2. It says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now this particular prophecy tells you where he is to be born, though this one that is to rule Israel, which is the Messiah, the Christ. It also tells you where he comes from. It says he is from everlasting. He comes from eternity and he comes into time. This was the very God of heaven come into the flesh of a man. Recorded for us, clearly, prophesied for us here in Scripture. So who really is in control? Is it Caesar Augustus? Or is it the God of heaven and earth who proclaimed 700 years before that this, this man and woman would go to their own hometown and there have this child. Now I bring this up because it is essential for you to see really the sovereignty of God, the, the rulership of God, that He rules in the affairs of men. This is essential for you to see because it really is essential for your trust to be able to trust the Lord with the, the struggles that you're in the middle of, some of you, even this morning. Have you ever felt controlled by someone else? Have you ever felt controlled by circumstances? You just say, I can't do anything about this. This is where I am, this is what's happening, this is what's going on, and I have no control over this, and somebody else is controlling me, or controlling this situation. Well, that's probably the way Joseph felt, wouldn't you say? I mean, you know, the decree goes forth, you need to be registered. Oh man, I gotta go back to Bethlehem. My wife is pregnant, and gosh, she's just about ready to deliver. I mean, I gotta put her on a donkey, and I've gotta take, go all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, this would have been several day trip. Several days it would have taken him to get there. Now can you hear yourself if you were Joseph grumbling just a bit thinking I don't have any control over my life you know here this uh, Roman Emperor you know, <laughs> decides uh, what I have to do and I gotta leave my home and Nazareth and my job and go back here and he was probably grumbling as you as I would have grumbled but the reality was, the Lord had a bigger plan. He had a greater plan, a plan beyond even what Joseph understood. And that plan was to fulfill his word. You see, to fulfill the very prophecy here in Micah 5.2. This child could not be born in Nazareth. He had to be born in Bethlehem. But how do you get somebody on a donkey with their husband that's pregnant, that would be the last place you ladies would want to be. Agreed? 
How do you get them there? How do you get this couple there? Who's in control here? It is the Lord who is truly in control. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 37, when King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, this is what Daniel the prophet declared to him. He said, The God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Now that's important. God says, He's the one who gives this king of the earth his power, his glory, his strength, everything he has. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did not respond to that instruction. He thought that he was the power and the strength and the glory, you see. He thought he was the guy who was in control. Well, the Lord warned him that if he was lifted up in pride like this, that he would humble him. And literally, he would lose his sanity. That he, so that until he remembered and knew that truly there was a God in heaven. Now in Daniel 5.21, Daniel is reminding Nebuchadnezzar's grandfather about this very thing. And he re tells him this story. He said that Nebuchadnezzar was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts. His dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. You see, God is the one who is ruling over Nebuchadnezzar, over his grandson, over Caesar Augustus, over all of these individuals. He is the one in control. The application of this is so important because when you feel like you're being controlled or circumstances are controlling you, you've got to fix your eyes above. You've got to fix your eyes on heaven because there and only there is the truth of who is running the show. In Acts 15, 18, it says there, James declares, known to God from eternity are all his works. He knows everything from the beginning of time to the end of time. He knows when that child needs to be born and he knows how to get that child to a place that that husband and wife do not want to go. And so a decree goes out from Caesar Augustus as a result of the decree of the God of heaven. So remember this. It says in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And so the Lord is taking all things. That's the good things and the bad things. The things you like, the things you don't like. The circumstances that are moving you, you think, in the right direction, and the circumstances that are moving you in a direction you don't want to go. He takes all things, and he works them together for good. So that's what's taking place in your life today. I want to encourage you with that truth. It is so important. Trust that God is working all these things out in your life for your good. The second section of Scripture, verses 18 through 14, notice it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger or a feeding trough. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest 
and on earth peace, good will toward men. Now, it's important, again, as a time note, that this took place not in the middle of winter. I don't think that this refers to uh, December 25th at all. This probably, just by the fact that these shepherds are out in the field watching their flocks at night, would mean that this probably had to be spring or early summer. Why do I say that? Because you have to understand that Jerusalem sits at over 3,000 feet in elevation. <coughs> Bethlehem is about three miles south of Jerusalem, few valleys and hills in between. And in the dead of winter, those shepherds are not going to be out in the field. They would be freezing. They, it snows in Jerusalem in the wintertime. Okay? It would be really cold. I've been there in March. I've been there in January. And I've been there in April. And I'm telling you, January is cold. It's really cold. In March, it can even still be very cold. I want to show you a picture uh, in the next slide. Is a picture of the city of Bethlehem off in the distance. Uh, this is when I went to uh, Israel with my wife in 1980. And there is my pastor sitting on that rock, Chuck Smith, and uh, he is giving us a study at overlooking the shepherd's fields. You can see the valley where the shepherds would have been. And in the, uh, at, the, at the beginning there, at the top of the mountain, is, of course, the uh, city of Bethlehem. Now, when this picture was taken, you can't see it, but down in the valley, there was a shepherd with his sheep grazing on the grass that was just coming up in the fields surrounding the city of Bethlehem. Down in that valley area is most likely where these shepherds would have been, grazing with their sheep. And so here we have a very, very good example of these, these shepherds' fields. And so very important. I think that that is essential for you to see the, this whole issue of when was Jesus born. Somewhere between the spring and summer of 5 or 6 BC. And we know that from these particular time notes that are clear in the scripture. Now note that the Lord did not send this message to priests and scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of his time. Now this is important to note because he sent this message to shepherds. Just everyday shepherds. Now why would the Lord do that? This is the most important message that could ever be sent to any human being at any time on our planet. And look who the Lord chooses to send it to. Just a bunch of shepherds out in the field. Now, it's important to realize that these shepherds heard this message, believed it, and they went to find the child. I'll bet you any money if this message would have come to some Pharisees, Sadducees, or scribes of the day, they would have said, oh no, couldn't be. These individuals responded, and that's why. It's important, I think, to realize this. Turn back with me to, to Luke chapter 1, when Mary is declaring who the Lord sends his message to. It says in verse 51 of chapter 1, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly, which is referring, she's referring here to herself. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. You see, Mary was lowly and Mary responded to the good things that the Lord sent her direction because she would hear the message and she would have 
responded to it as she did. That's why the Lord reveals himself as it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. Paul said, You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now we are the foolish things of this world, the weak things, the base things, the despised of this world. Because if you speak up for Christ, you'll get despised real quickly. We are the weak ones, but we know we're weak. You see, we are the ones that he has sent his message to, and you have responded. Every one of you in this room that has responded to the message of Christ, you have a heart just like the shepherds. And if you were out there in that field, he would have revealed himself to you because you have responded. He does not call the high and the mighty and the proud and the arrogant because they will not hear him. You have heard him. And that's why he chose these shepherds. Now he chose to give them a message. And this message was glad tidings of great joy to all people, anyone and everyone that will receive it, that there is a Savior. Now this is again the ultimate message, as I've already said. It's the ultimate message that could ever come to the ears of a human being, that there is a Savior. And I grew up in life not even knowing that there was a Savior. I remember going to a, a movie one time, unbeknownst to myself, a gospel movie. I mean, I was on a hot date one night and, in high school, and I drove into a, a drive-in theater, and, and there was... This, the greatest story ever told. <laughs> Little did I know when the movie started, I was sitting there like, really? I didn't know that. I remember I was shaken when the, in this movie, Lazarus was raised to life. I went, wow, can anybody really do that? I mean, I had never heard any of this stuff. And that message was the message that there is a savior, that this guy rose from the dead and he will save you from your sins. And I, I thought to myself, this is great. I went the next couple of days telling everybody, you gotta go see that movie. I mean, I'm not even a Christian. And I'm telling everybody they gotta go see this movie, this movie, that's powerful. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah, we've heard it. <laughs> Well, I'd never heard it. Well, that was the first time I heard the message of the gospel. And I'll tell you, it was powerful. Well, these shepherds heard this message, there's a Savior, a Savior born. Now, that means that if God sends a Savior, I need a Savior, right? I need saving. I cannot save myself. I cannot change myself. I cannot, I cannot forgive myself. That's impossible. I need to be forgiven. I need to be saved. And there's only one person who can do that. And that's Jesus Christ. That's what the God the Father sent him to do. To save you from your sin. So the question is, is there any one of you here this morning that is not saved? Are you, do you, or do you question, are you truly a believer? Because if you do, if you question that this morning, I want you to hear this. There's a Savior. If you just look in your own heart and see your own need of a Savior, simply just look at the things that you think. Look at the things that you've done. Look at the sin that you've committed. That means you need forgiveness and 
saving. You need to be saved and forgiven of your sins. And you can't do it yourself. I can't do it for you. Nobody sitting next to you can do it. There's only one guy who can forgive you and cleanse you of your sin. And so, for those of you that are here that are Christians, you have been saved. Let me ask you, do you still see your need of a Savior? Again, all you have to do is just look inside your own heart, listen to the thoughts, the evil thoughts that go through your mind, like they go through my mind, the corrupt, selfish, self-seeking motivations that we have. And you realize, I still need to be saved. I still need His help. I still need a Savior. That message is good tidings. Good tidings. Good news, in other words, that will bring great joy to your soul. Now, God announcing this, that He had met man's greatest need, is the greatest joy that could ever be brought to any human ears. And I pray that you have experienced that joy, that great joy of forgiveness. If you have not, let me tell you, you open your heart to Him this morning and He will bring great joy to your heart. Joy like you have never known. You say, well, does He really want to save me, Steve? I'm, I've done some pretty terrible things. Well, so have I. And so have many other people here. It says in 1 Timothy 2.4 that He desires all men to be saved. It's very clear. All men to be saved. That's the desire of His heart. It says in Romans 10.13 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, shall be. That's a guarantee it is God's promise. In Hebrews 7.25, it says He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him since He ever lives to make intercession for them. The word come in that text is in the present tense. It means those who continually come to Him. He will save. So salvation is at a point in time, but then salvation is is something that goes on and on and on until one day the Lord comes for us or we die. And then He saves us completely, body, soul, and spirit. You are in need of a Savior, if you don't know Him this morning, and you are in need of that continuous work of salvation, changing and transforming you inside. In Isaiah 45:20. There, God spoke to those that had escaped from the Assyrian invasion that had encompassed and, and overcome the ten northern tribes of Israel. And Isaiah says to them these words, Assemble yourselves, come, draw near together. You have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. You know, there's a whole lot of people today that are praying to gods that cannot save them. As these idol worshipers carried the wood of their own idols that overcame the nation, he said, they're praying to a God that can't save them. And Isaiah turns to them and says, why don't you pray to the God who can save you? The God who can take care of you. And that's what I encourage you to do this morning. Cry out to Him. Now notice this last statement here. The angel is joined by a multitude of heavenly hosts, or a multitude of angels. And these cry out in praise, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now this peace is the second greatest need of man. You need to be saved and forgiven. But after that, you need the peace of God in your head, in your heart. I'll tell you, that is the first thing that I realized that after I came to Christ, is I had peace inside. 
It's, and it's something that every believer looks for. But how do you get this peace? Is this just an acknowledgement that there's a blanket peace that comes on all the world just because Jesus is born? Not at all. In the NAS version, there it is correctly translated, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among men with whom he is well pleased. Peace only comes to men and women with whom he is well pleased. So the question is, how do you get him to be well pleased with you? Well, the scripture tells you and gives you the answer. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you want to please God, you have to believe. You have to put your trust in him. But secondly, to please him, you must have a right heart of, that is produced from a heart of faith. True faith produces a right heart that brings true repentance and then righteousness. You see this from Psalm 51. In Psalm 51 and verse 19, it says, Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. So what pleases the Lord? A sacrifice of righteousness. But you have to put this verse in its context. David is talking about a repentant heart that he has just asked the Lord for, and a heart that's honest with its sin before him, which he has just confessed. And he says, then, only then, you will be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. You see, only, God is only pleased by right living when it's followed by, it is, it is the result of a heart of faith that has a broken and contrite heart along with it. And so that's what pleases the Lord. Do you have that heart this morning? Are you pleased? Are you pleasing Him by your faith, your honest and upright heart, and the righteousness that comes forth from that heart? Now last, in verse 15, it says, So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger or in a feeding trough. And then it says, Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now these shepherds are an example to you in two very important ways. I want to leave this with you this morning. Think about this. These particular men were out in a field taking care of business, taking care of their their responsibilities and the angels come and or this, this angel comes and announces this birth and they do what they obey the message that they have heard they then with haste go into the city of Bethlehem they follow the direction that has been given to them this child is going to be in a feeding trough which was a usually a piece of stone that they hollowed out into like a, a half a can, basically, and they put the straw or grain in it, and that's what they ate out of. They find these feeding troughs uh, in archaeological digs there in Israel all the time. I've seen them, taken pictures of them. And so they, they know exactly where to find this child. They prove God's word to be true. And then they turn around and replace the angels who are praising God by them going out and telling everybody about what they have just seen and heard. Their example to you is a powerful one. First, these individuals tested God's word. They obeyed it and they tested it quickly. They went with haste. 
I believe that this is an essential thing that every believer must do. If you truly believe God's word, then you act upon it. And you act upon it quickly. You don't say, oh, sometime next week, sometime next month, uh, you know, when I get around to it, when I have more time. You don't do that. You say, this is God's word. I believe it. I'm going to act on it. If somebody came up to you and said, hey, there's a sale down at Kmart or Walmart or, or someplace, such a deal. You'd say, nah, next week sometime. No, if you believed their testimony, you would move. You'd get in your car and you'd go over and you'd check out the sale. That's what we do. If you believe the testimony, that's what you do. And so these men believed this word and they tested it. They proved God's word to be true. <coughs> now that is essential. Do you know that the Lord challenges you to do this throughout the scripture? The only place where God personally asks you to prove him, to test him, is in the area of giving. Did you know that? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this. Notice that. Try me. Test me. Says the Lord of hosts, If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You see, Jesus in the New Testament said the same thing. He said, give, and he said, it shall be given, pressed down, running over, shaken together, shall men give unto you. Same exact message. So God says, test me. In Paul's epistles, he said, whatever you sow is what you will reap. However you give is the same way you will receive. <coughs> but secondly, in obedience, you are encouraged so many places. Let me just give you one. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and verse 12. There God says to his people, if, there's the important question, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today. In verse 12, he says this, the Lord will open to you his good treasure the heavens to give and then he lists all the things that he will give but it is conditioned upon obeying him there's the key and then thirdly Jesus in Matthew 6:33 he said to his own disciples when he warned them don't seek after all the things that the gentiles are seeking after don't worry about your life and all of the things that you've got to provide for yourself. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. And he said, his righteousness. And he said, all these things will be added to you. Same challenge. God challenges you in your giving. He challenges you in your obedience. He challenges you in who is first in your life. If you will set him first, the result will be he'll take care of all the other stuff that we're worried about. Now, giving may not be your issue. You may have no problems with giving. Obedience may not be the issue you struggle with. You may be very obedient to the Lord. Who you are seeking may not be the issue. It may be something totally different. I guarantee you, the scripture makes it very clear. God challenges you. He gives you a promise, he tells you that promise, and then he wants you to prove him. Is this promise really true? Try it. See whether or not he will do exactly what he promises. Some of you, the Lord has spoken to you this morning. Some of you, he has been speaking to this week. He's telling you to do something. So, put him to the test just as the the shepherds did. Go see whether or not the things that the Lord has spoken have come to pass. And when you see them 
come to pass, you know what you'll do? The second example of the, the shepherds, they went and told everybody they could. If you see the Lord fulfill His promise in your life, you know what will happen? You'll want to tell everybody that you can what the Lord has done for you. You won't be able to be silent. You have to tell somebody what the Lord has done in your life. Notice it says in verse 15 at the end, they said, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. The Lord made known to them, and they turned around, and they made known to others what the Lord had actually done. It says in 1 Chronicles 16.8, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Psalm 89.1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. You see, with your mouth you have to make known His faithfulness to others, His mercy that He has had in your life. So, has the Lord done anything for you? Has He taken care of you? Has He blessed you? Has He had mercy in your life? Has He filled you with joy at the result of your forgiveness? Tell somebody about it. What, you know, if you talk about Jesus and you testify to Him, people can argue with you and say, well, I don't think that's true. But when you first speak about your own testimony, your own life, people have real difficulty saying, well, that didn't really happen to you. They can't say that to you because it happened to you. You're testifying to them. This is what the scripture tells you to do. As Jesus said to the man he ministered to in Mark 5, go home and tell what great things God has done for you. So just do that. Start there. And then when the other questions come, if you don't know the answer to the, some question that is given to you, you say, I'll, I'll find out for you and I'll get back to you. Now that, what that does is it opens a second opportunity for you to be able to share with that person. So go find somebody that's been with the Lord for a while, ask the question, get the answer, and go back and share the truth. This is the example he wants you to follow. Test his word by obeying it and see whether it won't come to pass. And then go tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's go to him in prayer. Thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to apply what you've heard today and mix God's word with faith. Believe his promises. Obey his commands. Take the action God requires, and God will begin to work in your life. If you have never made a commitment to Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today by asking God to forgive you. Invite Christ into your heart. Turn from any known sin and begin to walk with Him daily. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you would like someone to pray with you, please call our office at the number on your screen and someone will be there to help. Or in a moment, you will see a simple prayer on your screen that you can pray. Just pray that prayer from your heart sincerely and God will hear you. However you make your commitment, do it today. God bless you and join us again next week for Truth For Today.
You have opened up our eyes By your blood we've been redeemed Jesus, you have rescued me God of grace Master of mercy Teaching us to live a holy life God of grace Master of mercy Let Jesus Christ be to